Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. In this video, I'll be discussing the literary canon. This is a pretty broad subject, which will probably not be the trend on this channel. I think I will focus on more specific texts and theories, but I think this is a pretty interesting discussion. Just a general thing before we begin. I know I say this multiple times through the video, but I just wanted to say at the beginning, while I will be very critical of the literary canon, I am by no way saying that the books in the canon aren't good, or that you shouldn't read them. They are all pretty good books, and I would definitely recommend a lot of them. Anyways, in this video, I'll be going through what a literary canon is, what is included, what isn't, what are some of its problems, and in conclusion, probably not offer any solutions. So, what is a literary canon? Literary canon refers to a group of books, texts, works that are considered most important or influential in a particular period of time or genre. I think we can expand this definition to a broader one though, because often when we think of canonical literature, we mean something that was popular, or even just a general idea of quote-unquote good literature. There is a typical perception that these works are somehow quote-unquote worthy, and thus worth preserving and teaching. Think of texts that are constantly taught in high schools. To Kill a Mockingbird, Of Mice and Men, Animal Farm, Lord of the Flies, to name a few that were taught in my high school. These are texts that would belong in the literary canon. I will note that while I am very critical of the literary canon, I am in no way saying these aren't good or important books. I would definitely recommend every single one of these texts and many others that are within the literary canon. Furthermore, when we think of the literary canon, we tend to think about the Western literary canon, books that are influential in Western literature. I think if you ask people what or who would be a part of the literary canon, they tend to reply with Shakespeare, Milton, Homer's Odyssey, Shelley's Frankenstein, Charles Dickens, Hemingway, whom I have so many opinions of that I will not go into in this video, um, Orwell, to bring in someone more contemporary. There are so many. And I wouldn't disagree that they have had a lot of influence on Western literature. Shelley's Frankenstein is arguably one of the first science fiction novels and has definitely influenced the science fiction genre, horror, and Western literature in its discussion of the monstrosity and grotesque. But anyways, we can keep listing authors and texts that have influenced Western literature. However, the list will inevitably end. The nature of this way of categorizing things is that it is impossible not to exclude. And that's where my critique begins. Who decides the canon? I think this is a good place to begin problematizing the canon. Who gets to decide what's in the canon and what is outside of the canon? I think one of the most apparent answers is academia. Academics, universities, quote-unquote educated people, whoever that is, people that supposedly have authority on literature. Thus, we need to look at who these people are. Universities have been around a long time, and humanities are a crucial part of universities. I know the art degree equals McDonald's jokes and jokes about English and other art and fine art majors, but humanities were crucial to the origins of school and university. The idea of making someone well-educated used to mean that they were well-versed in languages, literature, philosophy, and natural philosophy, which is what we call science now. The institution of university can be a topic for another day. Anyways, universities were and still are for a specific demographic. Universities are expensive. Right away, this will exclude certain classes, and thus this becomes a class issue. Universities are extremely exclusionary for people with lower income because you have to put so much money and time into schooling that it really is a luxury. The way paid education works will always discriminate against lower classes. This kind of segues into the next problem of the exclusionary of people of color. There is an extensive history of colonization, slavery, having migrant workers that all contribute to Western society and Western countries. This then situates specific groups of people in systemic poverty, not to mention segregation in education in Western societies. When I say Western society, I am generally referencing the English-speaking Commonwealth countries and the U.S. There is perpetuation of labor roles for people of color due to systemic things like segregated schools, discrimination at work, prisons, and once again, this is a whole other topic that I cannot thoroughly cover in this video, and I'm sure there are so many other videos, blog posts, articles that will more thoroughly cover this topic. Um, I might find some and link them in the description. 
So we've established how it was and still is more difficult for people of lower income and people of color to be in universities and influence academics. I just wanted to bring up one last point that kind of differs from the previous two because it has definitely seen the most improvement. How much improvement is definitely up for debate, and it's another incredibly difficult topic. Women in academics is far more prevalent now than before. Women did complete university degrees in Europe through the 17th and 18th century, but it was very sporadic. Generally, women were not encouraged to pursue higher education until the 19th century. While there are many women in academics now, the increase in their influence is definitely up to debate. All this is to make us consider and think about who has the power in universities to influence literature and the literary canon. I don't want to generalize, but I don't think it will be making a preposterous claim to say that a lot of people that have had the most amount of influence in establishing the Western literary canon are white men. Now we need to think about how specific demographics would be influenced in deciding which books are important and which ones aren't. I found this quote in the article: "Literary canon excludes works, no matter how selective canon markers are." On the Daily Nebraskan by Jordan Bates to summarize this idea very well. Side note: I usually would try to find more academic sources, but I tried to see if the article had cited any papers, but I couldn't see its citations. Um, so I'm unsure if this is an interview or taken out of another paper, but anyways, this is a really good summary of what I've been talking about. The Western literary canon has historically been dictated by economically secure, traditionally educated, socially privileged white men, Brent said. Plus, literacy was historically the province of the privileged, and so the uneducated or minimally educated, which included some women, but most laboring class citizens of both sexes as well as children, were automatically excluded. The remnants of this class-based exclusionary thinking is visible in today's society in the disdain with which the cultural elite usually greet popular art like Harry Potter, graphic novels, country western music, and etc. I will link the full article below. What is excluded? What is not part of the literary canon, and why not? The idea of the literary canon is inherently exclusive and hierarchical. Because we understand something within the canon to be this broad idea of good, we are insinuating that they are therefore better at a higher status than those not within the canon. This is most obvious in what they teach in schools. It means they deem this book to be worthy of being taught. Therefore, this book is important and has ideas that are important. I'm not disagreeing with this. I think almost every book has something worthy of analyzing. I'm too scared to say every single book because I just know if I say that I will be proven wrong. But I think it's important to even critically analyze "quote unquote" bad books because it allows the reader to recognize and highlight problems within it. I think this is where my main problem with the canon lies. I don't think anyone could definitively say which texts are important and which ones aren't, let alone decide which ones are good and which ones aren't. And because a lot of authority figures that decide a literary canon are traditionally privileged white men, the type of texts that would belong in the canon tend to be texts that perpetuate the heteronormative patriarchy. I know this sounds like a very harsh judgment, but the fact is these biases do exist. While I do believe and like the death of the author theory, I can't help but notice that the authors of canonical texts tend to be white. It's different now with the emergence of ethnic literature studies, but even calling it ethnic literature studies suggests that they do not belong in mainstream literature studies. This brings me to a discussion of a more modern literary canon that is more inclusive of texts by people of color and women. Other literary canons. The inclusion of more works into the literary canon, or I prefer to think of it as the inclusion of other canons into the quote-unquote big literary canon, seems to be a good solution. We recognize our old biases, and now we are including more works by people of color and women. This, on the surface, would seem to solve the problem. Of course, I disagree because I use the word "seems" to solve the problem, but I do disagree. I disagree because this just seems to be a band-aid solution that keeps the structure of policing text intact. What do I mean by this? I'm going to begin with another quote from the article, but it is actually Bates quoting someone else. 
The sad irony of changing canons is that doing so merely replaces one set of narrow and privileged judgments with another equally narrow but different set of standards by which to decide who gets in and who doesn't, Brent said. And even sadder, canon revisions and canon substitutions are usually vindictive. The new, quote, in-group punishes the, quote, old by excluding it, bashing it, and admitting only those whose work reflects the new agenda that has been set in place. I think Brent perfectly captures the problem. The problematic structure stays in act. The canon still exists. It is merely being replaced. However, changing the canon gives an illusion of problem solving, making more people complicit in following this problematic structure. This is not a unique problem. We see these ways of seemingly problem solving all the time with companies and their quote apologies while changing absolutely nothing. I don't want to get too deep into this because this is a whole other rabbit hole. The oppressive structure of the canon stays and more and different people will be excluded while we feel that it has changed and improved. So what should we do? Honestly, I don't know. I recognize the usefulness of literary canons. It can make the world of literature seem less intimidating, in my opinion. For someone that wants to learn more about a specific genre, it's good to have a list of texts they should read to familiarize themselves instead of just having a massive library section called fiction. And I do think that some of these texts are incredibly insightful. They present very important issues in both nuanced and more didactic ways. There is a reason To Kill a Mockingbird is such a widely studied text in high school. It is an in-depth study of racism and the legal system reflecting the prejudices that existed and is still prevalent. In this way, I do see the positives of a literary canon. However, I cannot help but think about what it excludes. What about actual texts by African American writers? This is where I want to discuss more about the idea of ethnic literary studies. Perhaps you would read Toni Morrison or Octavia Butler in an African American woman's literature class. I think this is a class that actually exists in my university. But if in doing so, these authors are excluded from the mainstream literary world, then they are still nevertheless excluded. If we put these texts in an ethnic canon, we are still excluding it from the canon. In conclusion, personally, I don't believe in the literary canon. I think the canon is inherently exclusionary and often of specific groups of people. But I do recognize its usefulness and how it could help people discover more literature. At the end of the day, if you believe in the literary canon, then I implore you to decide for yourself what should be in it. Read whatever you want, write about whatever you want to write about, study whatever you want to study. Thank you for watching all the way till the end. I don't even think I fully covered all the sides of this topic. Who knows? Maybe when it's not final season, yeah, I wrote this script during final season for some reason, probably to procrastinate on writing my other essays. I will do an even more comprehensive discussion of this topic. Anyways, thank you. If you liked the video, please let me know. If you think there is anything I missed, I definitely know I missed some stuff. Feel free to comment or just comment on anything else you want to say. Have a good one, guys.